a todos, quer dizer, bem-vindos aqui ao INSPER. É um grande prazer tê-los aqui hoje em um evento que uh, é já uma, quer dizer, um evento de uma série de eventos que nós temos feito anualmente uh, com, a, com a Universidade de Tel Aviv. Mas, na realidade, esse nosso acordo com a Universidade de Tel Aviv é o mais antigo da história do INSPER, antigo IBMEC São Paulo. Na realidade, começou em 2000 e desde, na realidade, 2000, quer dizer, nós viemos tendo esses eventos anualmente, uh, tendo a satisfação de receber aqui professores da Universidade de Tel Aviv. E, quer dizer, fizemos eventos sobre vários assuntos e, esse ano, temos um evento sobre uh, a situação da economia mundial de hoje, que será abordada uh, sob aspectos micro e sob aspectos macro. E teremos também um debate, uh, digamos, relativo a esse tema. Uh, quer dizer, conosco aqui hoje, temos a grande satisfação de contar, quer dizer, com dois professores de Tel Aviv, que já estiveram aqui no Brasil, alguns deles diversas vezes, e que são pesquisadores extremamente conhecidos e respeitados nas suas áreas de atuação. Mas o professor Alex Zuckerman uh, tem escrito sobre política monetária, política fiscal, aspectos macro, e falará um pouco sobre esses aspectos aqui conosco hoje. E o professor uh, Elhanan Helpman uh, tem escrito sobre comércio internacional, crescimento econômico e assim por diante, e abordará aspectos micro em sua palestra. Para nós é uma grande satisfação e uma grande honra tê-los aqui conosco. Teremos também o diretor de política monetária do Banco Central, quer dizer, que está vindo, uh, assim, Carlos Hamilton, uh, que falará um pouco sobre a perspectiva do Brasil. E, ao final, teremos uh, uma discussão em mesa redonda, contando também com Otávio de Barros, que é o economista-chefe assim, do Bradesco. Eu queria... Também agradecer muito uh, a duas entidades. Primeiro, a Sociedade Amigos de Tel Aviv, aqui representado uh, pelo Mário Adler, quer dizer, amigo da casa, que, que tem colaborado quer dizer, muitíssimo para que a gente possa fazer esses seminários anualmente, que tem sido um grande sucesso. E, segundo, uh, o Bradesco, quer dizer, pelo patrocínio relativo ao seminário. Uh, então... Assim, sem mais delongas, eu chamaria o professor Helpman para proferir a sua, a sua palestra. Uh, e muito obrigado mais uma vez, é um prazer tê-los aqui. Obrigado muito. Estou muito feliz de estar aqui de novo. E eu gostaria de falar com vocês hoje sobre o impacto do impacto do trabalho na inequidade e, em particular, sobre a inequidade de Uh, I guess I don't need to uh, be detailed in discussing trade inequality in this country, which depends very much on trade. And trade has been instrumental for the economic development of many countries, obviously including uh, Brazil. Uh, it is hard to imagine, for example, that China could have grown as fast as it uh, has in, uh, in the last couple of decades, without having access to international markets, and similarly for uh, Brazil. The decline of trade as a result of uh, the recent crisis had a very strong impact on a variety of countries, and Israel is one of them. <coughs> It's a country which didn't suffer from the financial crisis per se, because the impact on the banking system was very minor but it did suffer significantly from the decline of world trade. If you look at the evolution of world trade over the years, you can see the sharp decline during the financial crisis. It hasn't recovered to its previous uh, development path, and the projections of the World Trade Organization are that it will not recover to the previous path in the near future. Now, As much as trade is beneficial because it uh, enables various countries to grow faster and to raise their standard of living, 
It also has some uh, unwelcome uh, consequences. And one of those that has been discussed quite extensively during the recent wave of globalization is its impact on inequality or on income inequality. Uh, now, the relationship between trade and inequality generally, or even in income inequality in particular, is uh, very complex. It's not a very simple uh, relationship. Uh, but people have observed that in many episodes of trade liberalization, there has been an increase in wage uh, inequality. And it has been thought at the time that much of the rise in what's known as the college wage premium in the US has been due to globalization. So if you look at the data from the early 60s uh, to about uh, the mid 90s, this was a period of rapid expansion of the supply of educated workers in the US relatively to the uneducated. And nevertheless, starting in the late 70s, the college wage premium, namely how much people get for a college degree as compared to a high, a high school degree, has increased from about 40% to 70%. And there were, was a view at the time uh, that this has been due to globalization. Now, it so happens that this type of development is not unique to the US. It happened in many advanced countries, but it also actually happened in many uh, developing countries. And it's also true that in a number of developing countries, in view of trade reforms, there has been some increase in the wage inequality as measured by wages of skilled versus uh, unskilled workers. As it happens, these type of findings are very hard to reconcile with the traditional approach to international trade that emphasizes a particular uh, setup. Uh, this framework emphasizes between group wage inequality, which is of the type that I've just mentioned, and particularly for skilled versus uh, unskilled uh, workers. It emphasizes reallocation of uh, resources across sectors in response to globalization or uh, trade reforms. And it predicts typically rising wage inequality in skill abundant countries like the US and declining wage inequality in skill poor, uh, poor countries. However, in the data in both skill abundant and skill uh, poor countries, this type of wage inequality has increased. So this a type of uh, framework proved to be very inappropriate to explaining what happened in the world economy during those years. And the, view, the estimates are that maybe one can use it to explain about 20, maybe 25% of the change in wage inequality between skilled and unskilled workers. And eventually the conclusion was that what explains this big shift in many countries was technological change, which has increased demand for skilled workers across the board, which means both across industries and across countries, and that this rise in demand outpaced the rise in supply in the countries in which indeed the skilled workers uh, increase in numbers uh, relative to the unskilled. At the same time, Something other quite interesting happened in, in research, and it's, uh, I want, this is the topic I want to discuss uh, today. Many labor economists who study detailed data sets in a, in a large number of countries, what they found was that a big increase in wage inequality is rather within groups of workers rather than across group of workers. In other words, instead of looking at wages of skilled versus unskilled, the sort of average weight of a skilled worker versus an unskilled worker, if you look within groups of skilled workers or groups of uh, unskilled workers, within each such group, the dispersion of wages has increased tremendously. I'll, I'll show you some uh, data to support this claim. So in response to this finding, researchers started to look for alternative mechanisms that link international trade and globalization to the structure of wages, hoping to find ways to explain this dramatic, pretty dramatic rise in wage inequality 
within groups of workers. And this new research has emphasized wage dispersion across firms, in particularly the fact that it so happens that different types of firms pay different wages to similar workers. And I'll show you some data on this. And the other is why within certain groups of workers, different workers might be paid different wages despite the fact that they have the same education level, they have the same experience, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so the starting point of my talk today is an analytical framework that I developed with two colleagues, uh, with Oleg Yitzhaki and Stephen Redding. Uh, Oleg was my graduate student at Harvard, and he and Steve are now teaching at Princeton. So we have developed an analytical framework which has an explicit mechanism that links trade to wage inequality. So obviously in this form, I cannot provide you the details of, of this. Uh, the paper was published in 2010 in Econometrica, so you are welcome to read it. But I want to give you just the bare elements of the framework, and then I'll show you how this framework uh, helps to understand Brazilian data. I hope you like this part. So here, here is the, the framework. So think about an industrial sector that produces brands of differentiated products. And as it happens, in these type of sectors, there is a lot of firm heterogeneity. There's a size distribution of, of firms, and there's a distribution of productivity of firms. Not all firms in a given industry are equally productive. We think about international trade as entailing both fixed and variable trade costs. We think about these type of industries and engaging in monopolistic competition. Uh, so the idea is that firms have specific brands of a product, so they have some degree of maneuvering as to the pricing of these goods. There are frictions in labor markets, as they are in many countries, and this requires some process of firms to be matched with workers, and these frictions give some bargaining power to workers within firms. Productivity of workers in particular occupations or jobs uh, are match specific, so there is some variability in uh, these productivity levels. After firms hire workers, they can screen them to some degree and identify workers with better characteristics for the job or le less good characteristics. And finally, firms and workers engage in wage bargaining within the bounds permissible by market forces. And this determines wages within individual firms. So what we showed is that this analytical framework, if you work it out carefully, generates predictions which are consistent with some of the broad patterns uh, that we observe in the data. The two particular predictions that uh, I want to emphasize are the following. If you look at the relationship between a firm's productivity and its wages, so on the horizontal axis here, we measure productivity, and on the vertical one, wages, <laughs> then the, the analytical framework predicts that only highly productive firms will export. So there is some cut of productivity here, such that firms with higher productivity exports, and those with lower productivity serve only the domestic market. And the analytical framework predicts that there will be a positive relationship between wages firms pay and their productivity. And particularly, the most highly productive firms pay higher wages. And there is this jump in wage at this point, which I will call the export wage premium. So when a firm with some productivity level switches from serving only the domestic market to exporting, it's bound by market forces to end up paying somewhat higher wa uh, wages because of its dramatic expansion in order to be able to serve uh, foreign markets. Again, I don't have time to go into the details, but these are the analytical predictions. The other analytical prediction is that if we look at the fraction of exporting firms, or more generally at uh, market opening, then if you start with very big trade impediments here, this will be some measure of wage inequality in these economies. 
And as you liberalize, trade rises, inequality of wages rises with it, and then eventually it starts falling. So in other words, generally speaking, you cannot expect to have a, have a monotonic relationship between the inequality and the distribution of wages and the degree of openness uh, of the economy. So these are the sort of two things that I'm emphasizing. There are many other things, obviously, uh, because I want to focus on, uh, on, the, on, on them here. The important thing is that all of this is driven by the specific wage premia paid by firms with different productivity and different premiums paid by firms which export versus those who don't export. And importantly, the, all these decisions about whether to export or not and wages are endogenous, as I have described uh, earlier on. All right, so in the last year, I have done some uh, empirical work using Brazilian data. Again, uh, my co-authors on this project are uh, Oleg Itzhaki and Steve Redding but also include Mark uh, Mundler from the University of California in San, uh, in San Diego. And in this work, uh, we have extended the analytical framework that I showed you before in order to be able to match some data. And the data we looked at is the Brazilian data. The data we have is very detailed data, matched employer-employee data from 86 to 98. It includes uh, workers in, employed in the formal sector. The analysis focuses only on manufacturing. We observe in these data individual firms, the industries in which they operate, the occupation of their workers. We observe individual workers. We know exactly in which firm these workers work. We know about the worker, every worker, the education level, the experience, uh, some demographics. Uh, and so on. It's a large sample. We have about 7 million workers every year in the sample. It's actually not the sample, it's uh, the population uh, and about 100,000 uh, firms in the manufacturing sector. We also have trade data for this period, which we matched with the worker and firm data. So we know about every firm, whether it exports or not. We know destinations uh, and a bunch of other things. Uh, the, we look at 12 manufacturing industries, uh, and um, these are the employment share. So the biggest ones are apparel and textiles and food and beverages. The important thing to note is that the fraction of exporting firms varies a lot across the sectors, from 3% in non-metallic minerals to about 12% in footwear. However, the exporting firms employ a very large share of, of workers. So obviously, the exporting firms, uh, so here you have non-metallic uh, minerals, 2.3%, per, uh, but they employ 32% of the workforce in manufacturing. So this tells you, and this is a general feature of data sets in many countries, that the exporters are much bigger employers, basically, uh, than non-exporters. In this data, we also have occupations of workers. Here uh, are five categories. We, we run, uh, they run between professional and managerial to unskilled blue-collar workers. The bigger category is what is called skilled blue-collar. Here is some measure of is the difference between the log wage and the mean log wage in manufacturing. So you see that obviously the professional workers get the highest wage and the unskilled blue-collar workers get uh, the lower wage. So this is the sort of general background. So one thing, you can, there are many things you can do, and we have done many things with these data. I want, I want to show you just uh, a few. So the, fa the first thing we did was we have decomposed the, va the variance of wages, which is a measure of wage dispersion, into the contribution of the variation within occupations and across occupations, within sectors versus across sectors, and within sector occupations. So you construct cells in every sector, a particular occupation is a cell. Uh, 
So within sector occupation cells versus across. And what you see here in 1990, and this is general, it's not only in 1990, within occupations explains about 80% of the variation, which means that the differences in wages across these five occupations explain about only 20% of the difference in wages. So if you think about the skilled unskilled uh, wage ratio, 20% of this ratio contributes to the overall wage dispersion, and 80% is what happens within the skilled group and the unskilled group. So this is the, an illustration of this more general point that I mentioned earlier on uh, for Brazil. If you do it uh, within sector versus across sector, about 83 of the variation is within sectors and 20 or 17% across sectors. So again, you look at wage differences across sectors and within sector, a lot of the distribution is within sectors rather than across sector. And if you do it uh, within sector occupations, obviously it goes down the within variation, but it's still the majority of the variation. So this is an illustration of the more general pattern that is observed in data sets, including uh, data sets in other, in other countries. Uh, the next thing I want to show you is uh, the importance of skill components and other con worker characteristics. So what we have done is we have estimated wage equations. For the economist in the audience, we have estimated Minzer equations, which allow you to account for the contribution of, say, education, experience, uh, gender, and the like to wages of workers. And then we have decomposed the entire variance of wages into the contribution of these worker characteristics on the one hand and the residual. And what you see here is that about 40% of the variation is due to observables, namely due to education and experience and the like. And 57 of the variation is due to unobserved worker characteristics. So this, again, this is not unusual in the Brazilian data. It's, uh, it's quite common. Now, if you look at the residual wage inequality, this is what labor economists call this component, you can decompose it into how much of it is within occupations and sectors and how much of it is across. And what this number shows you, that about 88% of it is within rather than across. So this means that 12% only emanates from the variation in the unobserved characteristics across uh, sector occupation. Also important, if you look at the growth, this is the majority of the growth in wage inequality uh, during uh, this period. Okay, so to see that this is not specific for this particular year, 1990, I'll show you now a graph which looks at it along the entire sample period. And what you see is that the blue line gives you the between sector occupation variation for the residual wage inequality. This is pretty flat during the entire period. And what tracks correctly the evolution of wage inequality over time is the within sector component. This is the red line is the within sector component, and the black line is what the data basically tell, tells you from, the, from this estimation. So the point here is that to understand uh, what's driving wage inequality, one has to understand this particular component. We have a pretty good understanding of how wages differ across workers with or different observed characteristics, because we have been estimating uh, Minzer equations for, I don't know, 50 years or something like this. And these numbers that come out from these equations are pretty robust to specification, and they, are, they vary somewhat across countries, but uh, not an awful lot. So the last decomposition that I want to show you, which will be the driver of the, pro uh, the proceeding analysis is the following. So the next thing, you can now estimate this type of wage equations 
but introduce also firm-specific effects to see how much each firm contributes to wages independently of worker characteristics. So if you think about the analytical framework that I laid out before, this analytical framework says eh, that because there is wage bargaining between the firm and the worker, it's possible that different firms will end up paying somewhat different wages beyond and above what they have to pay for the worker characteristics when they hire workers. So if they hire an educated worker, obviously they have to pay more. But in the bargaining, there will be some extra. And this extra will vary across firms depending on firm characteristics. So once you estimate this additional, this additional component, you get the following decomposition of what explains uh, the variability of uh, worker. So now only about 17% of the variation is due to worker observables like education and experience. Between firm wage inequality, which is this extra component that every firm is bound to pay depending on its characteristics, this explains the majority of the variation, about 38%. And then there is within firm wage inequality, which is the residual 34%. And I will not talk about the covariance. I mean, uh, there's an explanation of why there is some covariance between the firm effect and the worker uh, observable characteristic. So this says that if, you are, if we are to understand some important feature of the variability of wages, we have to understand this, this particular component. Now, why is this component important? Not only does it explain the biggest chunk of the wage inequality, but if you look at what happened over time, this was the bigger driver of wage inequality. So this explains about 86% of the change in this distribution of wages in Brazil between 86 and 98. So I'm going to focus from now on on this component, namely the extra that a firm has to pay to worker in the bargaining process due to the firm characteristics. Okay. Okay, so we have taken the analytical model and we have estimated it on the Brazilian data. And I'm sure you don't want to, me to spend even five minutes explaining how to estimate this monster, but there are ways to do it. So once you estimate it, you have parameters and you can use the parameters to generate moments and to see how they match with the data, basically to see if the match is good or not. But I'm talking now only about this component of 38%, which comes from firm characteristics. So this table uh, shows you the moments in the data and the moments in the model. Just look at the first and the last column, and you don't want to study each number separately. But let me just give you a rough idea of what we show here. So this is mean employment. It's all in logarithms, so you cannot translate it easily into natural numbers, yes? Uh, so this is what the data said. This is what the model predicts. Uh, mean wages, again, in logs. This is what the data said. This is what the model predicts. So th you see they are pretty close. Uh, there are other things here, like the standard deviation of employment and wages. The fraction of exporters in that year was 5.5% on average. I showed you the table. There is a big distribution across sectors. The average of this distribution is 5.5. And the structural model predicts also 5.5. By the way, Brazil has a small, in, in those years, small fraction of exporting firms. The more typical fraction would be like 15, 20%. And in some countries, like Norway, it would be, or, or, or Sweden, it would be much higher. So this is a pretty small. So one issue is, you can ask the question, how can such a small fraction of firm have big effects? And the answer is, on wage distributions, this small number of firms has big effects because they are the big employers. 
as I showed you before, they employ close to half of the labor force in manufacturing. So this is why, despite the fact that it's a small number of firms, they can potentially have a big effect on wage inequality and, of course, on other characteristics of the economy as well. Uh, uh, the lower part of the table decomposes this into conditional means and variances for exporters and non-exporters, uh, so I, I'm going to skip it. The other interesting thing is so what I showed you before where was the matching of the data with the model, uh, quantitative models prediction uh, for these firm components using the distribution of firms in the population. Uh, here what we look at is the worker level moment. And again, you can look at it, but the one thing I want to sort of emphasize is the inequality. So if you calculate the Gini coefficient in the data, it's low here because it's not the Gini of the wage distribution in Brazil, it's the Gini of the component of the wage distribution, which is due to firm effects. So this is why it's uh, not as high as uh, the Gini of the entire wage distribution. So this is what is in the data. This is what the model predicts. There are different measures of inequality here, like the 90 relative to the 10 percentile ratio, the 50 versus 10 percentile. And you see the comparison that was in the data and what's here. The lower numbers are sort of quite important to understand in view of the analytical framework that I showed you before. I showed you this uh, the pr analytical prediction of the relationship between wages and firm productivity and the jump at the productivity when a firm starts exporting. And I called this jump the export wage premium. So the estimated export wage premium, oh, The estimated uh, export wage premium is here in logarithms, and this is what the model predicts, so it's not a perfect match, but it's not a bad match as well. And there's also a size premium, which says that if you switch from non-exporting to exporting because you have to serve a bigger market now, including uh, uh, countries to which you export, you hire many more workers, so this is the uh, employment premium. So this is what the data says, and this is what the model predicts. So all of this uh, comes to say you can estimate an analytical model which will have properties that reasonably closely match uh, the Brazilian data, and hopefully this will be true about uh, other data sets. We are now working on Swedish data, and uh, we hope that we'll find a similar match there. The one thing I want to show you here is the match of the entire wage distribution. So the blue line is the, this is the density of wages in the data. Again, when I say density of wages, this is the firm component only. I'm not talking about the entire wage distribution, just the firm component. And the red one is what the model predicts. Here there are two uh, density functions, one for non-exporters and one for exporters. What you see, the broken lines are for exporters. The entire wage distribution for exporters is a rightward shift of the distribution for the non-exporters. So there is a, a, a substantial overlap, but obviously the mean for the exporters is significantly higher than the mean for the non-exporter. The entire distribution essentially shifts to the right. I have three more minutes, and I'll finish on time. So the next one I want to show you is how the model tracks the data uh, over time. So you estimate the model in every year during the sample period, and then you can generate predictions of inequality from the model and see how it tracks the data. So again, uh, the blue line is the data, and the red line is what the model predicts. And what you see, it tracks uh, the data reasonably well, basically until the implementation of the real program. After that, you had a huge uh, real appreciation, and the model sort of doesn't do very well after this big macroeconomic shock. But this is your fault, not our fault. So the next thing we can do is we take the model, 
we take estimates for one particular year and we ask the question, uh, how does the relationship between trade frictions and wage inequality behave in the model, in the empirical model that we estimate? And this is basically a simulation of the model for different levels of trade frictions. And what you see is it corresponds to the analytical prediction from which I started, which says that if you are a highly closed economy, you have low wage inequality of this particular type. And then as you trade more and more by opening markets, wage inequality rises, but it rises up to a point, and then it starts falling. So it's a non-monotonic relationship. This is what the empirical model predicts as well. For Brazil, what ha happens is that if you take the years in the sample, all the observation points are to the left of the peak. So there's no observation to the right. So this says within the, these bounds, trade liberalization is expected to increase this component of wage inequality. Okay. So if you take the estimate from, say, 1990, and you go back to 86, uh, and you ask, by how much has wage inequality increased between 86 and 90? And what fraction of this does the model explain? The answer is the model explains about a quarter of the increase, which means that three quarters of the increase has to be explained by other factors, which are obviously not uh, uh, included in this model. OK, so th 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 this is a sort of very fast overview of how one can think about certain component of wage inequality in many countries and with an illustration of how it works on Brazilian data. To so to summarize, using this very rich data set of matched employer-employee, uh, we find that about two-thirds of wage inequality is within sector occupations, and only a third uh, is across sector occupations. So like in the US, it's hard to explain the rise on inequality just by the college wage premium, basically. This is what it says. But it is a broader statement, because it says not only the college wage premium, but anything that affects worker wages that is observable, such as experience, not only education. Uh, uh, the residual wage inequality is as important as worker observables overall. And the between firm component is sort of the biggest one that we could identify in the data. And this is what this new analytical framework that has emerged in recent years uh, managed uh, to explain. And what's important is that what the statistical work does is it establishes that the between firm wage dispersion is in, affected in a very important way by trading relationships. So whether a firm trades or not has a big or a very significant effect uh, on wages and explains a significant part uh, of the wage dispersion. So to conclude, this uh, uh, suggests that if we, we are to understand how globalization affects inequality, we certainly have to first understand how it affects wage inequality, because wages are a big component of income, but not only wages. And that there are different facets, actually a fair number of facets, of this relationship between trade and wage inequality. And I have today emphasized two particular ones, but there are many gifted researchers in this institution, and I'm sure they'll pick it up from here and come up with more reliable estimates. Thank you very much.